Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. To me, a perfect day is working out in the yard with the temperature about, oh, 70 degrees, a little breeze, no mosquitoes, and lots of butterflies fluttering around. I'm Mary Holm, and today on Prairie Yard and Garden, we are going to find out about my favorite butterfly, the mighty and beautiful monarch. I've been kind of worried about my little friends, the monarch butterflies. Two years ago, it was hard to even find a monarch. Last year and this year, there have been a few around, but not very many so far. Today, our guest is Margaret Kuchenreiter, who is going to let us know just what is happening with the monarch population. Welcome, Margaret, to Prairie Yard and Garden. Thanks, Mary. It's great to be here. Tell us, um, Margaret, about yourself, and I know you teach at the University of Minnesota Morris, but what's your background and what do you teach there? Well, I'm a botanist, and my specialty is ecology and conservation biology. So I teach courses in ecology and in uh, plant systematics, which is the identification and classification of plants, and evolution of biodiversity. And my research is on um, prairie ecosystems. So since moving to UMM, I've been interested in both native prairies and some of the management that can keep them healthy and also reconstructed prairies so that they can be at their healthiest and best. How do the monarchs fit into your research and into your uh, teaching? So my most recent research project concerns some pollinator mixes that have been put together by the Natural Resource Conservation Service for use on farmland and other places. And we're interested to look at how different mixes of the forbs, which would be the wildflower component of these reconstructed prairies, um, work to support different diversity of pollinators that might um, come to these plantings. So my students and I have been out monitoring what's in bloom and which insects are visiting, and among those insects are monarch butterflies. Tell us about the, um, the monarch migration. I've heard that they travel great distances. That's true, Mary, they do. They are the butterfly in the world that has the longest migratory route. So if we think about monarchs in the wintertime when they're not here in Minnesota, they're down in central Mexico in the province of Michoacan and they live at in um, volcanic mountains in the Sierra Madre. They live in, at about 10,000 feet where the conditions are just perfect for them so that they're in kind of a quiescent stage where they don't have to eat very much. They kind of hang from these Oyamel fir trees in a very secluded valley and there are fogs that come into this valley to provide them with moisture and so they overwinter in these really small little areas in the mountains of Mexico. Then as days become longer in the spring which would be in February and March down there the butterflies start to leave these overwintering sites and move into more northern Mexico and maybe as far as southern Texas and at this time, then, the monarch um, reproductive organs have come into maturity, and so these butterflies mate and lay eggs on milkweeds that are in that area. And then their larvae will grow 
and become new adults. And then those adults are the ones that will travel all the way to Minnesota and to Canada and the eastern United States to then have more generations here during the summer before they begin their migration back south to through Texas to Mexico for the winter. So they actually will have several generations or have at least one generation before they arrive here in our area. Yeah, that's really one of the things that's so amazing about monarchs is that the monarchs that are here and the ones that will travel back to Mexico have never been to Mexico before. And their parents who were in Mexico are, have died. So there has to be an inner um, genetically based homing system that the monarchs have. And people have done research on this and have found that it's not uh, a magnetic compass, but rather they can orient by the sun to be able to figure out how to get back to Mexico. And then those butterflies that overwinter in Mexico have a generation, let's say, in northern Mexico or Texas that's never been to Minnesota before, but they can get back here. How did that ever come about that we found out where they migrate to? Well, there was a uh, professor, Fred Urquhart, who was at the University of Toronto, and he started research on monarchs in the 1930s. He just really got interested in seeing that there were monarchs in the summertime in Toronto and that they were gone during the winter and he didn't know where they went. So he and his wife, um, first of all, they decided that it would make sense to try to tag monarchs to see um, if they could be recovered along their migratory pathway. And so he worked for several years to try to figure out how to get a tag that would actually be the right weight and the right stickiness so that it could stay on a monarch during its whole migration. And I guess by about 1940, they had figured out how to attach tags that would stay on monarchs. And then they started basically, I think what must have been one of the first citizen science programs to enlist people between Toronto, Canada and places farther south to try to recover these tagged monarchs. And it took actually, believe it or not, until 1975 until they found the overwintering spot of these monarchs in the mountains in Mexico. Was it still the same professor that was involved in the discovery or how did that happen? He and his wife would correspond with people that were finding these tagged monarchs and he got some correspondence from a person who lived near Mexico City and he and his partner decided that they would try to find where the monarchs were because it was very clear there were monarchs west of Mexico City and so this guy and his partner spent a lot of time looking for monarchs and uh, it turned out that in the spring of 1976 he contacted Professor Urquhart and told him I have found the overwintering spot and so then Professor Urquhart and his wife went down to Mexico with some photographers of the, from National Geographic magazine and went to these order, overwintering spots and he said if you read the accounts it was like a dream come true that he found the trees essentially just festooned with billions probably of monarch butterflies and as the story goes he was in this forest and a tree branch fell right in front of him and he bent down and looked at all the monarchs on it of course they're very quiet because they're quite cold and he found a tagged monarch and this monarch actually is related to Minnesota because it was tagged by some people who live in Chaska Minnesota and so that was the very first proof that his monarchs had made it from Minnesota all the way down to the Oyamel Forests in Mexico. I know that it seems like we don't see very many monarchs around and um, you know I had mentioned that about two years ago I really didn't see any at all. What happened to our monarchs to cause their population to decrease so much? Well unfortunately it's, so, it's sort of a perfect storm. So if we start out with um, the Mexican overwintering site. As I said, it's extremely small in aerial coverage. And there have been logging pressures from people around that area that are cutting some of these fir trees and making the site um, smaller for uh, monarch overwintering. People are also concerned that climate change may be harming 
um, the overwintering site because just a little increase in temperature or a lack of those beneficial fogs would make it so that the, suit w the site would be n not as suitable for the monarch overwintering. So that's some of the things that we're worried about down there. As we think about monarchs moving from Mexico to Minnesota and Canada, um, the problem there is really lack of two kinds of plants that are important for monarchs. The first is the larval food plant, which is any plant in the genus Asclepius, which is the milkweed. And one of the things that's happened is that, of course, there's been um, radical uh, disturbance of the monarch's native habitat, basically because people want to create urban areas and also farms. And we, so we destroy um, the native areas where monarchs used to be able to rear their young. Um, especially concerning recently is the advent of genetically modified corn and soybeans that are glyphosate resistant. That means that farmers can spray their fields with this broad spectrum herbicide killing off everything except the corn or soybeans. And it used to be that um, agricultural fields had lots, quite a few milkweeds in them. And now because of glyphosate resistant plants, there are very many fewer um, plants available for the monarchs to use to rear their young. I think also we tend to maintain our ditches by mowing them all the time. Uh, homeowners tend to like a really, you know, bluegrass lawn and maybe not as many weedy plants, what they might consider weedy plants or even ornamental plants around their homes. And so there's not, uh, neither are there milkweeds for the insects to rear their young or nectar plants for the, for, for the adults. A couple years ago too, you might recall that there was that really bad drought in Texas and that probably knocked back a lot of the nectaring plants that the monarchs needed to use on their way back down to Mexico. So there are two kinds of plants that they need, food plants for the larvae and then nectar plants for the adults. And so that's why the milkweeds are so important to the monarchs then is because they, re re they need them for their food source. Right, so when an adult monarch butterfly is looking to lay her eggs, she is seeking specifically for any of a number of species of milkweeds. In our area, that could be the common milkweed, it could be swamp milkweed, it could be whorled milkweed, or um, a little closer to, or a little ways away from us, it could be butterfly weed. So those are the native milkweeds that would be in our area. And um, so she's looking for those, she lays her egg on that, um, plant. And the reason that monarchs use milkweeds is because they have evolved a relationship with this plant such that the plant is highly toxic to most species that want to eat it. It contains a group of chemicals called cardiac glycosides. So if you were going to eat mo a milkweed, um, it would make your heart actually, it could make your heart go into arrest. So it's very toxic compound. Um, but monarch larvae can tolerate this compound, and in fact, they do more than tolerate it, they sequester it in their bodies, which then makes the adult monarch butterfly be toxic to things like bird predators. So if you're a blue jay, I've seen um, videos of this, and you ingest a monarch butterfly, and only a naive blue jay would do that, it'll cause the blue jay to actually throw up. And after the blue jay does that, the blue jay will learn, this is not a good food source for me. So the initial butterfly that get, gets eaten doesn't benefit by that, but all of its relatives would because the bird will learn that it's not a good thing to eat monarch butterflies. Can you tell us what the, the life cycle is of a monarch? Like um, when, what time of the year around here do they lay their eggs? and about how long does it take for the eggs to hatch. And then um, I've seen caterpillars, and I think um, that there's different names called instars or something for those. Can you explain all of that? As I said, the female butterfly will be looking for a place to lay her egg on, a, on milkweed, and that egg will take several days to hatch. And when it hatches then, it will turn into a little caterpillar. And the first caterpillars are tiny. They're just millimeters long. And then those caterpillars will go through what are called five instars. And an instar is a developmental stage of the caterpillar where the first instar is very tiny. The 
caterpillar will eat the milkweed, then it'll shed it, molt its skin, turn into a bigger instar, which molts its skin, turns into a bigger one, and they pass through five larval stages. After the caterpillar has reached its maturity as a caterpillar then, it um, goes into a resting stage called a chrysalis, which is a really beautiful green little pupil stage with the little gold dots that are so beautiful. The larval stage of the caterpillar lasts 10 to 14 days, and that depends upon um, temperature because the development pattern is temperature dependent. And then the chrysalis stage lasts about 10 to 14 days, and then the adult monarch um, emerges from that chrysalis. Another interesting thing to know is that any time before it's time to migrate, so these monarch butterflies that are being born in, in um, the spring in Mexico or Texas, those monarchs are pre-programmed, we could say, to live just a very short time. So they're programmed to essentially mate instantaneously, lay their eggs, and then they die. But the monarchs that are um, nectaring around us right now that have just emerged here in August and September, those monarchs have reproductive organs that are not developed at all. And they are programmed to live a long time, actually from now all the way through until let's say next March or so, when they reproduce and then they die. When you do your research, how can you tell the difference between a male and a female monarch? Can you describe that at all? There are several different characters that you can use to tell the difference between male and female monarchs. The most distinctive one is on the hind wing of a male monarch, there's a little, it looks like a, a dot. Um, that is a gland that actually in some species of butterflies secretes chemicals that help in their mating. Um, so the males have that dot, the females don't have the dot. Also if you look at the end of the abdomen, which is the very hind end of the butterfly, the males have little organs that are claspers that they use in mating and the females lack those. It looks like you brought some samples along of the larvae. Can you explain what stage these are in? Okay, so I have two monarch larvae here. One of them has just entered its third instar. So this is, you know, egg, first instar, second instar, third instar. And then this one, the larger one, is in its fifth instar. So it's actually just about big enough to form a chrysalis. And I found both of these eating common milkweed in my garden. I actually followed this littlest one for a couple of days. I found it when it was only about three millimeters long. And so, and that was like three days ago. So it has really increased in size in that short amount of time. So if you're actually finding um, plants like milkweed especially in your garden that are being munched upon, be sure not to powder them or do anything or spray them because you may have monarch larvae using them as a food source. Oh, that's absolutely true. I would not add any insecticide to my garden at this point at all. Um, it's also Karen Obishar from the University of Minnesota also found that actually boundary spraying for mosquitoes will also um, affect the development of these larvae. How do you know what the instars are? So there are excellent websites that you can consult um, to look for information on monarchs. And one of the best is actually Karen Oberstar's website at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She has a website that's called Monarch Lab. And she has a citizen science project that she's in charge of that is uh, aimed at monitoring monarch larvae. And so that particular website tells you exactly how to look at these larvae, um, what their markings are like, how big these tubercles are on their um, tail end, and how you can tell which instar of monarch you're looking at. Margaret, what can we as citizens do to help our little friends, the monarchs? Well, there are a number of things. Um, I think the first thing to do is to learn to recognize and love milkweeds. So, for example, in my perennial garden at home, I have milkweeds as well as the other plants that I'm tending. And some milkweeds, like swamp milkweed and butterfly weed, are actually really choice 
plants to include as part of a perennial landscape. So having milkweeds in our yards that can, uh, where the butterflies can rear their young is I think really, really important as a homeowner. Also planting um, a variety of plants that the adults can use for nectaring. And if we think about what some of their favorites are, uh, they need something right away in the spring when they get here to Minnesota. So actually chives are one of the things that monarch butterflies love to nectar on in the spring. Also some species of salvia and viburnum will be species that they will use in the spring as they move north. But when their populations get really large in the fall and they become most conspicuous, that's when we really think about the plants that we can use to host them. So, um, for example, this plant we're looking at right here, Tithonia, which is a Mexican uh, torch, um, is really preferred by monarch butterflies, as are almost all the plants in the composite or daisy family. So if you think about plants like purple coneflower, uh, goldenrods, cosmos so lots of the plants that would be native to minnesota also blazing star that's another real favorite of monarchs along with joe pie weed and all of those make really good plants for the home garden um, if you don't want to grow perennials and you just want to grow annuals this mexican sunflower is an annual here uh, zinnias are also plants that are really uh, favored by monarchs so having a garden that is full of these plants in the composite family will really attract monarchs during their adult phase. I think beyond the homeowner, if we think about our larger landscape, I'm really hoping that this new buffer law uh, will be embraced by people, uh, farmers who own land that they need to buffer now. And instead of planting a mix that maybe is just a regular old pasture mix that they might consider planting natives that would uh, contain plants that monarch butterflies would really like. I think also refraining from mowing ditches, especially during the summer when they could be hosting milkweeds or other plants that adult monarchs uh, would like, it would also be a really good way that we could enhance the roadside environment for um, monarchs in our area. So I think everybody can pitch in. Even if you can just have a little pot of flowers on your doorstep, you might find that an adult monarch will come by and, and use that for a little sip of nectar on its way south. You had talked about butterfly weed. Could you describe that? Is that the one that blooms orange? Yes. Yeah, so most of our native milkweeds here have either pink or fuchsia or white flowers. But butterfly weed is a native that has bright orange blossoms. I think I've seen that actually driving along I-94 sometimes down to the Twin Cities and um, it's very very beautiful. It's very beautiful and it has been included in a lot of the highway plantings by the DOT. Common milkweed is the one that people think of as a weed but it is actually native to Minnesota and then swamp milkweed has I think about the best smelling flowers of any plant that I've ever encountered and they're bright fuchsia and they tend to like a little bit more of a moist environment. So you might find them along the edge of a marsh or in a roadside ditch where it's a little bit wet. And then there's a very diminutive milkweed called whorled milkweed that has very thin leaves and white flowers that you can find in somewhat drier situations, native prairie in Minnesota. Asclepias syriaca, which is the common milkweed, is pretty aggressive. I mean, I find it, it has underground rhizomes and it comes up all over in my garden. So I'm constantly having to kind of tame it back to the places that I want it to live. But swamp milkweed and uh, butterfly weed are a lot better behaved in a manicured garden situation. Another species that monarchs love, love, love is Budlia. It's called butterfly bush for a reason. And unfortunately, it's a it's not a perennial here in Minnesota, but you can grow it really well as a containerized plant and it will attract monarchs like crazy during their migration. I have a question. Should I be deadheading my perennials as I do my annuals? Yes, yeah, some uh, perennials will really benefit from deadheading and this nephida or catmint is one of them. This blooms early in the spring and it's a lovely uh, prolific plant, but it often looks really shaggy after it's bloomed. 
So then it's a good idea to pick it up and actually cut it about in half. So you take off all the old blooms and a Nepeta cat nymph will often bloom again uh, after you've trimmed it back. Uh, Menarda, uh, sometimes Rudbeckia, will also bloom a second time if you deadhead them. So you want to wait till the plant's completely done blooming and then cut all the flowers off, maybe a little bit of the foliage. So you'd be taking off a third to even one half of the plant. They, not, they look better, it's neater, and they'll often uh, encourage them to bloom again that same summer. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Are there any other things uh, that you would recommend for people to have for their monarchs also? Well, in my yard, uh, I try to think about all the things that a monarch needs. So I have the milkweeds for the larvae, I have the nectar plants for adults, but I also, uh, it's really nice to have kind of a, a water source for the butterflies, so a really shallow area that's filled with mud and a little bit of water and rocks is really good so that the monarchs can get um, water if they need it. Also, I have some beautiful silver maple trees in my yard that have very downward arching branches that the monarchs roost on in the evening um, in August and September. So they have a place in the morning to pick up a little solar radiation to get warm and get going, and then a place to roost at night. So having woody vegetation for roosts, water, and those all important food and nectar plants make a great monarch habitat. Margaret, I've heard of a, a thing called monarch way stations. Can you fill me in on uh, what that is all about? So one of these citizen scientist programs called Monarch Watch um, which is the one that does the tagging of monarchs to follow their migration south in the fall, encourages people to make these monarch way stations. And essentially they're plots of selected plants, including both the, the food plants for the larvae, as well as some of the plants we talked about, zinnias and uh, cosmos and any kind of sunflowers and goldenrods that the adult monarchs can use to refuel on their way south. If you fulfill all the requirements necessary for the Monarch Way Station, you can become a certified Monarch Way Station. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and teaching us all about the monarchs. It's been so interesting. Well, it's been great to join you to talk about this important topic. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org.